I want you to rejoin the government. We're facing a terrible crisis. Uh, it's not been a brilliant time. We're going to completely refocus and reset the entire government and I want you to be the centrepiece of it. Will you do so? And I said, mm, I'm not sure about that. I'll think about it. And he looked at me in a slightly quizzical way and said, when you say think about it, you mean like 10 minutes? And I said, no, <laughs> no, no. To I'll, eat yogurt. I'll come back. You know, I'll, let me think about it over the weekend. He said, no. He said, this is going to be announced tomorrow. <laughs> And I said, no, 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 Gordon, you, can't, you don't understand. You know, I've got a job, a trade commission. I, I've got a, you know, I can't just sort of up and sticks and leave Brussels and rejoin your government. He said, you've got to. Here we are again. There's no reshuffle here on how to win an election. Everyone's still in their place. We've still got new Labour mastermind, Peter Manson. Hello, Peter. Hello, Matt. Uh, Polly McKenzie was director of policy for Nick Clegg of the Coalition. Hello, Polly. Hello, Matt. And uh, Tori Brainbox, Danny Finkelstein, is here as well. Are you enjoying us adding in constant different yeah, ways of you um, saying that you're yeah. losing Danny into the intro? <laughs> uh, now, although, Polly, you were boasting that you had a record of losing elections, but a source has been in touch with us with details of when you first won an election. I now have the full details of the first election Polly won through underhand means. The first year form captain elections at her school in Monmouth. She was up against my wife, who for the purpose of the election is the noble but thwarted Al Gore, winner of the popular vote but loser on a technicality. They both want to be form captain. Uh, me being English said to Polly, no, don't vote for me, I don't care. I voted for Polly. Polly being an election winning machine took my vote and then voted for herself. That was what tipped it. <laughs> Do you remember any of that? I remember none of that. <laughs> And that's how, Isn't that, that convenient? That's how political memory works. Yeah, so thank you to our secret source, Tom Whipple, Science Editor of the Times. Apparently his wife ran against you at school. His wife, ex, um, at times as well, yeah. in fact, yeah. I thought you were about to say ex-wife. I was going to say ex-wife. No, <laughs> another... I, I, I missed friend. that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe... I shall, I shall have words with Catherine. Well, if you want to get in touch with any other times that Polly's done you over, you can email <laughs> howtowin <laughs> at thetimes.co.uk. Or if you've got questions or comments or queries or complaints about the podcast, you can email howtowin at thetimes.co.uk. So, uh, let's turn to how to win at a reshuffle. So, you've got a former Chancellor who became Prime Minister, struggling in the face of grim economic headwinds, turns to a former political foe, sticks him in the House of Lords, and prays it will help turn the polls around ahead of a looming election. Sound familiar? Of course we must face facts. Electorally, we are in the fight of our lives. And yes, we do start that fight as underdogs. But conference, let me say this. If I can come back, we can come back. So that was you, Peter. Uh, on your comeback, that was at the 2009 Labour Party conference. You returned to the cabinet a year earlier as a peer to help Gordon Brown try and turn things around. It's probably fair to say your relationship with Gordon Brown up until that point was probably more fraught than even that between Remainer, David Cameron and Brexit here, which you soon had. So take, take us back to 2008. You're minding your own business. Gordon Brown, what, picks up the phone, comes around with a box of chocolates? How does it work? I'm minding my own business, very, very happily being European Trade Commissioner, existing in the rest of the world, not barely thinking about uh, Britain. But every now and again, I would get an invitation from somebody who knew Gordon, who was close to Gordon. This is in the months beforehand. And they'd say, why don't you come around for dinner and just chat about you know, how things are going in Britain, which were pretty grim. Uh, Gordon faced a terrible and torrid first year as Prime Minister when everything went wrong and he slipped further and further down in the opinion polls. And so I'd give my advice and my two halfpenneth worth and go back on the next train to China, Japan or somewhere in Africa or whatever. And then things became a little bit more intense and I remember Gordon phoning me. I was in Singapore. He phoned me literally in the middle of the night uh, and said, I've got to make a statement tomorrow about I cannot remember uh, uh, what. How do you think I should, you know, deal with it? And I thought, God, you know, here I am, fast asleep in Singapore, couldn't be further from uh, the scene of action in uh, London. And he was basically trying to sort of reach out and to befriend me and make things up and sort of 
you know, and I would say, look, you know, if I can help you, I will. But the last thing I thought was that I'd be helping him by actually returning to his government. And then on the fateful week, um, I was due to return to London to be briefed by the Treasury on the financial crisis and the crisis in our banks because they needed to smooth things over, over with the commission and make sure the commission was, was happy with their recapitalization of the banks, which was going to take place that weekend. And it was a Thursday and I went into the Treasury. I was duly briefed and then I was asked whether I could just nip into number 10 to see the Prime Minister. So, of course, I went in, I sat down in the small wood-panelled state dining room at number 10 and there in front of me was a pot of yogurt, a slightly browning banana and a sort of slightly curling sandwich. And that was lunch. <laughs> and Gordon came in and said, thank you very much, you know, for coming to see me. I'm sorry, you know, it's a short notice, but I wonder whether I could sort of make you an offer. I said, well, like, like this lunch. <laughs> and he said, no, uh, I want you to rejoin the government. We're facing a terrible crisis uh, it's not been a brilliant time. We're going to completely refocus and reset the entire government and I want you to be the centrepiece of it. Will you do so? And I said, well, I'm not sure about that. I'll think about it. And he looked at me in a slightly quizzical way and said, when you say think about it, you mean like 10 minutes? <laughs> and I said, no, <laughs> no, no. I'll, eat yogurt. I'll come back. You know, I'll, let me think about it over the weekend. He said, no. He said, this is going to be announced tomorrow. <laughs> And I said, no, 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 Gordon, you, can't, you don't understand. You know, I've got a job, a trade commission. I, I, got a, you know, I can't just sort of up and sticks and leave Brussels and rejoin your government. He said, you've got to. And I said, well, do you mind if I call a friend and get some advice? I went out and I went round to see Tony Blair. And by the time I got to Blair's office in Grosvenor Square, Gordon had phoned him. <laughs> and Gore, Tony received me with a very, very broad Tony-ish grin and said, you couldn't make it up. And I said, well, what am I going to do? And he said, Gordon's rung me. He's asked me to make sure that you say yes. And you've got no alternative. If in a state of national crisis, the prime minister asks you to do something to help the country, you've got to do it. So you've got to do it. And that was it. My fate was sealed. Just remind listeners about how bad your relationship had got with Gordon Brown. Well, I have to. Clearly you were... <laughs> well, I, I could it was ask pretty the, dire. I could ask the question. But you were Just there at the beginning of the formation of New Labour with, with, with Gordon and Tony, but then over time... So, it, so if well, it we were the, the three musketeers. Yeah. And we, um, from the late 80s onwards, we were the three modernisers of the Labour Party and it started basically after the 1987 election. They were up-and-coming members of the Shadow Cabinet. I was the party's communications and campaigns director. And we formed a really strong CADA, and we couldn't have been closer. I mean, everything we did was sort of hand in glove, and we consulted each other on everything, every speech, utterance, statement, political move. And all was going swimmingly until, tragically, John Smith died in 1994, and then we had to make the fateful choice uh, between the two modernizers, um, Brown or Blair, and Brown uh, blamed me eternally thereafter, uh, for the choice of uh, Blair. It was not my choice. All I did was to say, look, let's sort of, you know, stand back and decide which of you has the better chance, you know, where your support lines up, etc. And overnight, the, the, the entire sort of party, trade unions, Labour MPs, even in Scotland, moved like a block to Tony. And I was the one who had to go to Gordon two days later and say, look, you know, you just got to look at what's happening amongst the MPs, look at the opinion polls, the trade unions lining up. I'm very sorry, you're going to have to, if you want to beat Tony, if you want to stop Tony running, you are going to have to summon the most enormous dark forces and you are going to have to go in and just could have kill him. Do you really want to do that? If you do that, the modernizers will be dead. You know, we'll just be set at each other's throats. Mm. It will be the end of the whole project. You've got to decide one or the other. And I've got to tell you, in all candour and friendship, uh, the party is lining up behind Tony and not you. And therefore, we've got to decide how you're going to airlift yourself out of this and I'll give you 
every support and help in doing that so that you come out of it sort of strongly with your dignity intact and everything. And from that moment on, Tony, of course, won the leadership and Gordon barely spoke to me again because he just thought that I had but been behind this manoeuvre. Ten uh, years. Uh, uh, for, for ten, ten years. years. He sort of... I mean, we had the odd conversation now and again. Um, but basically, he and his gang did for me in, in the most sort of ghastly way. And uh, so that made it all the more sort of ironic and dramatic... <laughs> When I was summoned in, you know, to the yogurt and the banana in the small <laughs> state dining room, uh, to be asked to come back and save his government, which I did as a very loyal deputy. I mean, people, some people said to me afterwards, you know, your job is to make sure that Gordon doesn't last, that he's replaced with a, a genuine new Labour modernizer. They wanted mm. uh, David Miliband, and there was one sort of attempted sort of skirmish or coup after another. And I wasn't having any of it. I hadn't come back to bury Gordon Brown. I'd come back to save Gordon Brown. I'd already, inverted commas, buried him once. I wasn't going to do it again. Uh, and therefore, I stood behind him all the way through. And even to today, some people blame me for the loss of the 2010 election because I didn't move quickly and sharply enough to replace Gordon with uh, David Miliband. But, of course, the person who didn't move, the person who sort of quivered uh, and wouldn't make his move against Gordon was, of course, David Miliband, and I wasn't going to do it on his behalf. It's an amazing story, yeah, but the parallels, Danny, with what's happened this week with David Cameron coming back, yeah. given that basically David Cameron and Rishi Sunak <coughs> fell out when Rishi Sunak backed Brexit and he was told, yeah. if you do that, your career will be over because Remain are going to win. They were, they were squabbling only six weeks ago with the fate of HS2. It's true. And now it, here they are. I mean, it's, it's clearly not, not as bad as no. I mean, I think, I think 10 years more of no yoghurt. They don't really basically have much of a relationship at all, though. Mm. I, I, you know, I think... Rishi Sunak has a better relationship with George Osborne probably than, or you know, hitherto than with David Cameron. I don't really think they're that. They've been that close. They've had the sort. Of, you know, Peter will know is when you when 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 I was working with William Haig, for example, you were constantly thinking, what will John Major think of this change that we're making, and you'd ring them up. And that's the sort of relationship you have with a former leader. And I don't think Rishi Sunak's relationship with David Cameron went much beyond that. He wasn't in Parliament for long before mm. David um, fell. His relationship has always been very strong with William Haig. And, I, you know, there have been suggestions that William was, a, you know, a bit of a go-between between the two of them. But I mean, you can always phone yeah. up. You can always phone up David Cameron. You'd have that relationship with him. It wasn't the same. This The relationship that, that Peter had with with. Gordon Brown was had been so intensely close, and then it split. I think that's different, isn't yeah, yeah, it? Yeah. It started in the mid nineteen eighties, yeah, yeah. so, so it, it was a very intense so relationship. It wasn't did, two did, people who were part did, of the did, same project. Did David come and speak to you about it before? No, David? he didn't. And I, and I and I think that I think um, that it was it was kept secret, and I think that he must have only told one or two people. If I had to guess. I would say he told. He'll definitely have spoken to George Osborne about it and he'll have spoken to Andrew Feldman about it, Lord Feldman, who was the chairman of the Conservative Party and he's his closest ally and friends at university. He, they talk about everything. And I think, and he'll obviously he'll have consulted Samantha, but that he wouldn't have gone beyond that. If the moment any either of them went beyond that, if he if 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 Rishi went much beyond James Forsyth and Liam Booth Smith, it would have leaked. The problem, Danny, is that uh Sunak would have been worried uh, about Cameron turning him down. I mean, so he certainly didn't want it leaked. He didn't want it sort of pumped into the media ether and a discussion started in case Cameron didn't then come yeah, back and that would have been portrayed as a huge setback. I, so it had to be done in complete secrecy. I bet he got William to ask him that question first. They wouldn't have had a meeting in person until if they well, knew William, that he would... Because William, for example, himself, I know, and anybody who's spoken to William would know, would, would if he'd been offered it, 100% have turned it down. So you wouldn't have have um, asked yeah. him in the first place. I bet you anything that a feeler was put out to David before. Polly, take us to the moment when you saw David Cameron walking up down the street. What went through your mind? Uh, actually, a bit of a sense of relief and positivity. And it, it actually did take me back to... Uh, I remember being just a sort of lowly opposition advisor uh, when Peter returned to government. And there was a sense of calm... Because politics is so dominated by these rivalries and resentments and the who said what to whom 20 years ago. And who, and it, it's so toxic so often. And 
And if you think about what's happened to the Conservative Party, where we've had this rapid succession of prime ministers, each of which has very clearly tried to define themselves against the previous one, um, and their big radical policies have been unpicking policies that they backed just a few months or years ago, the, the idea of actually making, I guess, a big open and generous offer, which is the language Cameron <laughs> used when he uh, offered the coalition agreement to the Liberal Democrats, of just saying, let's, let's find forgiveness. Let's be in the same team. Mm. It, it's only the beginning. Mm. But actually, to, to have a team instead of a set of rivalries and resentments that have all gone toxic and mouldy is the only way to actually move forward. I think this is a very good point Bol is making. Look, when I came back, and this is why it's not quite the same as uh, David Cameron's return, I was brought back in order to make the entire government function differently and, and, and better. I was brought back in order to enable it to help it to communicate better to the outside world, but also to smooth over and heal some of the differences and ill feeling that had grown up in uh, Gordon's uh, cabinet. But it was all part of a major reset a strategic reset of the whole government. The whole point of my coming back and joining the Economic War Cabinet was part of the government's entire refocusing on fighting the global financial mm. uh, uh, crisis. I am not so persuaded that David Cameron's return is the beginning of a major strategic reset of, of Rishi Sunak's uh, uh, government. I think for that to happen, Rishi Sunak would really have to decide what sort of Tory leader he wants to be, what sort of Tory government uh, he wants to lead. Is it a sort of centre-facing, moderate, unifying, one-nation uh, Conservative government, or is it one which tilts more uh, to the right and is fending off the draining of support from the Conservatives to the further right reform party and I think that what Sunak wants to be is the right leaning conservative leader with a bit more centrist vibe and that's what he's <laughs> getting uh, from David Cameron I think it's a piece of wonderful sort of window dressing and very elaborate <laughs> theatre I mean not quite as dramatic I mean after all David Cameron is only returning to the government for the first time I mean he's not the three times comeback kid that I was <laughs> Um, and, you know, so he's a sort of... Thankfully. He's a, he's a young <laughs> pretender. He's got some way uh, yeah. uh, to go. He was also walking down uh, up uh, Downing Street yesterday, minus that wonderful crimson red uh, jumper uh, that <laughs> sparked so much speculation in the media. You know, but what was it made of? Where was it bought? Your, your, the, this was your jumper. This was yeah. my jumper yes. when I walked up Downing Street. And in the end, the press office... So settled on, well, it's a cashmere mix, you know, <laughs> sort of very new labour. Uh, uh, sort of, yeah, and that's satisfying. You're wearing a very but, nice jumper today. Was that sort do you know, of think, It's well, a sort it's, of rust brown. The thing about walking up Downing Street, and you, there's always these photographers yeah. outside, and I said to one of them once, because they kind of ran around trying to photograph me after I'd left number 10, and I said, you're just keeping that in case I get into a scandal. But there's no way that you're going to run this under any other circumstances. It's only if, I, if I'm in a scandal, your editor will go, oh, has anyone got... Oh, well, we're still waiting, Danny. Yeah, we're still waiting. <laughs> Danny, Danny Fickle no, scandal. Got, but I, I agree with Peter. So um, I think that choosing this is a... Make, choosing to remove Suella Bradman and put David Cameron in the cabinet is an extremely big choice. The question is now, will he see it through? If he doesn't see it through, then it is pretty pointless to yeah, do yeah. it. Well, in a moment, I'm going to ask uh, whether or not reshuffles in general, we'll look at some other reshuffles that you've all been involved in over the years. Do they make any difference to ultimately winning over a public who might not be taking uh, that much notice? We'll do that next on how to win an election. So we've done the reshuffle of this week. Let's talk about reshuffles in general, how you put them together and when they've gone well and when they've gone badly. What was your involvement in reshuffles, Polly? So the idea of reshuffle, it, you know, there's always a whiteboard, as I understand it. Uh, for the Lib Dems, when we were in government, uh, the whiteboard was somewhat smaller um, because we had only a very limited number of, uh, of ministerial you had positions. You separate whiteboard. You weren't sharing the whiteboard. Oh, no. Oh, because uh, so the way it was done during the coalition is, is the Lib Dems sort of had a certain set of posts and we could put any Lib Dems into them. But it would have been a whole other bit of negotiation to, 
to switch ministries. That that was, you know, you'd need, a, I don't know, a bigger whiteboard <laughs> for that. But essentially what you're trying to do is is match people to, uh, to roles with the possibility that, of course, some of those people, especially if they're being demoted or moved sideways, might say no. So you've got to be, you know, constantly adapting. That's why you need the whiteboard, because you can cross out the names, put the new names in. And, and you're trying to balance both the need for capability and competence and actual expertise, but probably more of the consideration is about how do you balance the political needs of what the party wants from you? Because a, a kind of a cabinet is is partly a team, but also partly a, a coalition from within the party of trying to represent the different interests so that you can then hold your parliamentary party. They will feel that there's someone who's their guy uh, on the inside. Um, and did you know what the Tories were doing? Because, you know, there was, you know, like... No, no never. So, so you didn't, you couldn't play, oh, we'll put so-and-so there because, that you know, that will offset them or we'll wind them up. Or, I mean, Norman Baker going to the Home Office was a particular... That was just trolling them. Just tro <laughs> The guy who thought MI5 was at the root of everything and you send him to go and oversee MI5. MI5. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. that's great, right? <laughs> uh, Danny, what about your involvement in well, in reshuffles and how how you can get them right? Because if you, as we've seen uh, this week, Suella Brahman gets the sack, and there's the concern: is she, is she a, does she become a martyr? Actually, does she diminish soon after? What's the, the one of my most consequential involvements was actually completely accidental. Where in one of his reshuffles, <laughs> Ian uh, David Cameron decided to offer Ian Duncan Smith a move from being uh, the welfare secretary to being justice secretary, and Ian asked to speak think about it overnight and the story that he would been offered these two things leaked and I was going on Newsnight part of a panel I was going to offer my opinion and while I was waiting to be on Newsnight I saw Nick Robinson on the news saying that this had been offered to Ian Duncan Smith so when we were asked our analysis on the program I said look if if he's been offered uh, this move um from justice, from welfare to justice, these will be the reasons. And I, I just re rationalised why it would be and gave the reasons. Apparently, Ian Duncan Smith was watching, <laughs> unaware, unaware that Nick, Nick Robinson had said this on the news. He then thought that I'd been informed of this by George Osborne, <laughs> that, I, that, this, that this whole offer to uh, Ian Duncan Smith had been engineered by George to destroy his welfare reforms and that I, as George's friend, which of course I am, uh, was then articulating this on Newsnight to put more pressure on him. And he went in the next day and turned down this role with that as one of the reasons why he did it. He swears now that it wasn't the whole reason, but I understand it was a pretty <laughs> substantial part of it. And so... I inadvertently ended up uh, leaving Ian Duncan Smith in a position where he later then, of course, resigned at a point of maximum uh, difficulty for both George and David on uh, on just as the referendum was uh, coming up on an issue of welfare policy. So that was probably the most consequential involvement. A lot of the time, um, one of the things that, well, a lot of the time there's a lot of speculation that goes on in the press about who's going to be moved. And most of that comes to journalists from people who want to be seen to know what they're talking about. So journalists will ring up somebody and say, "Who? what's going to happen with X or Y person? And they, not knowing, because the leader hasn't told them, but not wishing to admit that they don't know. Um, you know, for example, you asked me the question, uh, did I know about David Cameron moving into the cabinet, which despite being a friend of both David Cameron and Rishi Zunak, I did not. Um, the, the You don't want to admit that most of the time. So you uh, people will then give some some speculation which is actually completely unfounded they don't because the decision hasn't yet been made so lots of reshuffle stories actually um, which then influence the reshuffle themselves because the way. things go ahead yes. of time. so what do you think Swella Bravma will do now and is it a well, problem look, is it better that actually she was sacked no, rather than she, being allowed to resign I, I I think it was better that she was sacked simply because I think it was she was bad for the country and that she was the my main calculation I think having a home secretary who is effectively sort of describing the police preposterously as woke, effectively, um, uh, you know, you'd, and who was using constantly using divisive language, which made it harder to do what tough things a Conservative Home Secretary will need to do. Uh, you know, I think it was good that she's been removed. She had a political strategy that works either way. I don't think she wanted to be fired because people don't want to be removed as Home Secretary. But she has a political strategy that works perfectly well if, it, if she does because it puts her... You know, she wants to be to the right of Kimi Badnock and to the right of James Cleverley so that she can pick up the votes of right-wing MPs in the future leadership competition. It works perfectly well for her. 
So it may turn out to be a good deal all round. Good for Rishi Sunak, good for Suella Braverman, and very good for the country. And Peter, in terms of, you know, under the banner of how to win an election, there are moments where leaders, I want to think of you know, David Cameron, moved Michael Gove from education secretary ahead of a general election because he's become really unpopular with parents and teachers and so on. Most of the time, reshuffles happen. We get very excited at Westminster. Nobody takes any <laughs> notice of the real... Goodness me, what's happened to Victoria Atkins is not something I suspect has been said a huge amount outside the Atkins household this week. What has happened to Victoria Atkins? I think she's now <laughs> a health secretary. Well, ah, well, well done. Done. You've got that one right. Very good. Um, um, but wait, from your time in government, do, Look, did reshuffles make any difference yes, ultimately? Yes, they did. Oh, they made a huge difference. Look, what is a reshuffle? A reshuffle is about you know, refreshing our cabinet and getting rid of duds and bringing in fresh talent. I mean, at a mundane level, that's what a reshuffle is. Actually, it's part of a sort of continuing negotiation between a leader, between a prime minister and the rest of his party. And what you're doing the whole time is having to appease and assuage you know, party favourites and people who sort of you feel you've got no alternative but to bring on or have stay there for a little while before you dispose of them. But you're also trying to use a reshuffle and the makeup of your cabinet, you know, to bring definition to your government and what you are about, what you stand for. You want a, a cabinet in a sense which sort of reflects your own uh, political outlook and also enables you to stamp your own authority on the government as a whole. And Tony Blair, who was, in my books, a, a very good, very clear thinking, a uh, strong leading prime minister, nonetheless had a problem with, in his later years, with reshuffles. He started off in 1998-2001 creating cabinets of all the Blairite talents. I mean, people who were, in a sense, you know, in, in office, in his own image, reforming, modernising, new Labour people. But as he became progressively sort of worn down and battered, first by Iraq and then, of course, cumulatively by Gordon Brown, uh, who wanted his job next door, he, 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 there was a sort of fading trajectory of his premiership. And I always remember uh, the, 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 what I thought at the time was a real sort of nail in his coffin, which was the reshuffle in 2006. And he was, right, I'm going to fight back, I'm going to reassert myself, I'm going to show who's in command of uh, this government. And it all revolved around who would be foreign secretary to replace Jack Straw and he couldn't decide whether it be, should be Charles Clark coming over from the Home Office or David Miliband being promoted into the cabinet and he fumbled both. Charles Clark ended up leaving the government altogether uh, and David went to the environment rather than to uh, the Foreign Office and the person, the last person on the whiteboard, you know, with a yellow post-it name with a name on was Margaret Beckett. She was completely stunned to become... I mean, you would have thought she'd be thrilled, but no, she was stunned, and you, you may or may not recall what she said at the time. Uh, OK, let's just leave it there. Yeah, you're not going to... Yes, uh, she swore. She said... She, so, yeah. Yes. I mean, <laughs> God almighty. I thought you were going mean, to say it then. Me, foreign... Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was the end of... Yeah. That was really the end of Tony, because he had failed to put either Charles Clark or David Miliband in as a viable contender to Gordon Brown, and his succession was essentially sealed in that, you know, fiasco of a, re, of, a, of a reshuffle. And it went downhill during the summer, and in the September, October conference, Tony went to the party and announced that he was, that was going to be his last conference, and, uh, uh, and, that, and that was uh, uh, the end. So that was a very good example of how you can use a reshuffle you know, to really strong political effect. But when it backfires, it can do you real lasting damage. Uh, the decline of a prime minister's power always happens. The, the job of the prime minister is to try and slow that decline as much as possible. But you are essentially reshuffling over time with a smaller and smaller deck because there's the people who won't be part of it, the people who've already been proved to be incompetent, the people who've had a scandal, whatever it is. And... Um, so being able to actually assert power is a part of it. And sometimes you reshuffle and you can reclaim power. But very often you can't. And so you're continuing to sort of 
keep fiddling around. And that's kind of where we've got to with this government is we've had so many reshuffles. You know, uh, Nick Gibb, who was the uh, education school minister for, I don't know, since the dawn of time, has now finally stepped down. But on the other side, you've got the housing minister. I mean, what are we on? The 173rd housing yeah. minister? 16th, I think uh, it is, literally 16th. And, yeah. and, and, and so, well, well, the eighth since two thousand and nineteen, housing you know, minister. So that's how much your ability they attach to housing. But that means that your ability to actually govern is massively impeded. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. we've got a new health secretary. Um, health will be a defining feature in this general election. And I, I don't know much about Victoria Atkins, but I do know that no one understands the NHS. Uh, at all, really. And a new health secretary at least takes three to six months to really orient themselves in the system. And so that means that all of this change will, in the end, actually make it harder for them to achieve the changes that are needed to make the difference so that they've got some sort of sense that like good work is ongoing by the time yeah. the election comes I, around. Look, I, I completely agree with that. That That is, interestingly enough, was David Cameron's view of reshuffles, and he tried to do relatively few of them. And you end up getting forced into them because people resign and then people uh, refuse get arrested yeah, exactly. for stuff or you know speeding well, yeah. or, that, just yeah, that's, you that's know hypothetically yeah uh, and so that does um you know that you do end up being forced into more reshuffles than you wanted to do but but he didn't think of them as a strategic tool i think it's because at the certain beginning of his government he had an idea what he was trying to do and he knew the sort of people he wanted to do it and there and he, that didn't really change mm. um and i i think that you know, what this represents, what this big change represents very late on in the government is Rishi Sunak still trying to trying to establish what it is that is his strategy and his statement. And this is quite a big statement of that. The question, you know, interestingly, Peter said uh, at our first podcast, he'll move through time for a change into Britain's on the right track, don't turn back, and best of a devil you know. Well, he's just moved yeah, from, from the time change. for a change, questions, which I never thought was, <laughs> as a, was a possible conference. The conference slogan I didn't think was possible. But to a more Britain's on the right track, don't turn back sort of strategy. In other words, Continuity since 2010. Um, you know, we're it's still the sort of one month, Danny, in order to change gear from <laughs> one to the other. Yeah, exactly. well, maybe, he's I mean, maybe he's listening to the podcast, <laughs> but he Colin. hasn't even completely changed because, as Peter was saying, he's he's still trying to do everything. He's still got a minister for common sense yeah. sort of woke thing. You know, the, the rea- there is 32 people now it's the attending minister for cultural wars. cabinet. Yeah, yeah. the but minister what? for cultural wars, uh, 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 Esther. Well, it's McVeigh. still you know, it's, I, I remember once. Uh, when one of when Pope Benedict was appointed, that one of my colleagues was very disappointed. They had appointed a Catholic to be Pope, and and <laughs> um, the uh, you know uh, the, the truth is that of course the government's full of conservatives attached uh, that follows a broadly conservative agenda, but it's still quite a consequential move. Even moving Victoria Atkins, you know now you've got Victoria Atkins and Gillian Keegan and Jeremy Hunt. Uh, and David Cameron, uh, and even you know James but it's Stephen, the fact rather than Alabama, this could definitely a shift. To not in... then have Minister for Common Sense doing culture wars on the telly. You can tell that he is not managing to actually make decisions by the fact that there's 32 people, right? Like that's enough for an entire rugby match against half of the cabinet with substitutes. Like that, that is too many people. <laughs> that's agree. not an effective now, what, what, decision making. Before we move on, the, the cabinet this. isn't a decision making body though, in that kind of way. No, but yeah, cabinet but meeting. But it's it's the thing is to say, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, did you ever make a decision in cabinet? I mean, when I attended them, if, if everyone spoke for two minutes, you'd be there for an hour on one item. As I told you last week, we made a decision to go for the concept of HS2. It took 10 minutes for purely political reasons and one of the worst decisions we ever took. <laughs> Shouldn't have been left to the cabinet. The other very small consequence of all this is that uh, meetings, reminding people about David Cameron and the coalition years and all that, Ed Davey was on the radio this morning, your old boss, Polly, trying to sort of say, David, can no, I don't, I don't think I know. I don't, if I met him, sort of trying to do this, this whole sort of, uh, I, no, no, I don't. The name rings a bell as if he hadn't spent, you know, the best part of five years sitting in, sitting in his cabinet. In his cabinet. Well, Ed wasn't in cabinet to start with. No, he was the minister until, for... Uh, until, until Chris Hume was arrested. Yes, yes. employment and skills. He, he did a good job, actually, I think, as the, as the energy secretary. Uh, but... Yeah, I mean, the Liberal Democrats are struggling, really, with trying to own their history. Um, I think all parties go through that. Um, And Rishi Sunak has made this a bit of a step to try and own his history instead of disowning it. Uh, My own view is that Liberal Democrats would do better if they could make a strong case for what they tried to do and what they succeeded at during that period in government, because uh, I 
don't think anyone's going to forget. Mm. Probably. I don't know. M- maybe the voters are paying less attention than uh, I give them credit for. No, they're not. All the voters are listening to how to win an election. <laughs> I'm sure that we'll, important. at some point, we'll obviously have to look at this on this podcast, but the Liberal Democrats have put themselves in a very interesting position whereby they can only have a relationship with Labour. And actually... David Cameron being appointed was an opportunity for Ed David to get out of that position, whereby Keir Starmer knows, and I know this because I've spoken to people around him, he doesn't have to offer Ed David anything. Yeah. But we can talk about yeah. that dialogue we'll another time. Uh, in a moment, I want to do some of the uh, letters and questions and emails and complaints that have come in uh, from listeners. So we've been talking about uh, political earthquakes and reshuffles and all that sort of thing, but Peter, you were just admiring the uh, the footage of what's going on with this volcano in Iceland. It took you right back to when you had to deal with a of the, the it was the, the ash, ash crisis. Cloud. It was yeah. the ash cloud, cloud crisis, and it was a Sunday. And we had to, I had to chair a ministerial meeting in Cobra, uh, beneath Whitehall under the cabinet office, and uh, I'd sort of slightly sort of, sort of not th- thought through how I was going to appear <laughs> after the Cobra when I had to do a press conference in Downing Street to explain the government's decisive response to this, and I was unfortunately wearing a sort of rather light cream l- linen jacket, which I thought was rather fetching, but other th- <laughs> people thought just made me look completely You ridiculous. remembered this, Polly. I do. Like, it, it's a really visceral memory for me. I remember feeling deeply assured and kind of crushing on Peter. Oh, thank oh. you. And it was before I met you, Peter. Oh. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Well, if we're talking fashion, Polly, would you like to explain why you're wearing a T-shirt with Love Kills Fear on the front? Uh, because this is my, uh, the demise of, uh, I mean, political demise, of course, Suella Braverman uh, t-shirt mm. uh, because I, my political philosophy love kills fear and let's have more love in politics plus I'm speaking at a uh, an event with young people oh today. so you're wearing a so t-shirt I thought a t-shirt would be the, the right vibe Very good. for that okay let's do some instead of my daft questions some questions from listeners uh, Joseph Bodie emailed how to win at the times.co.uk said daddy said in the first episode that Sunak has three dates to call an election May or October next year or January 2025 why those three months in particular why not February or November I follow politics very closely and constantly hear these months repeat as the only options for Sunak but without a clear explanation as to why why can't we have an election in June <laughs> it's it's a good question you could but you could you wouldn't want to have this election in June because you'd have the local elections in May I mean mm. you do have them Theresa May did call it but you have the local if you're Rishi Sunak you have the elections in local elections in May um, you wouldn't want to have the general election on a different date we were going um, to have an election in may in 2001 to coincide with the local government elections but foot and mouth, oh, foot yeah. and mouth. took over yeah. and i remember uh, i was not in the government famously by then but i remember <laughs> tony uh what calling brief, and said brief he said one of my brief sort of intervals between shows between appearances and he said <laughs> do you think it would be all right if we move the election from may to june i said oh, people would be relieved they wouldn't couldn't care less he said but mm. we can't have the may elections you know then the june i said move them both yeah, move them both. They move them both to June. But we what? did have an election, remember, in December. Yes. Fatefully, right. 2019. And we discussed last week. Yeah. Oh, we'll so we but he won't do it like this time. Because, yeah. because of May, you wouldn't do that. You, you, wouldn't want to, you, you wouldn't want to be campaigning in August is the reason why, uh, not October. Yeah, but you can technically call it whenever you fancy. It's really about the... Practicalities and, and what else is going on in the year and, 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 stuff like, and, and too also, hot or too cold or on holiday or whatever. You've got the conferences as well, so you either want to be before them or coming out of them. Well, that's it then. If you want to email us, how to win at the times.co.uk. Uh, my thanks to Daniel Finkstein, Polly McKenzie, and Peter Madison. That was How to Win an Election. How to Win an Election, wherever you get your podcasts from. <laughs> <laughs>